I believe that people read the way they eat. So they might want a hot dog for lunch one day, and the next day they'll go out for a fancy French meal with wine and the whole nine yards. And I think that's really important to our reading lives. And I wanted the book to represent that, to be more of a, of a menu uh, that people would find inviting rather than a prescription you know, that was homework or physical therapy. Um, and so I wanted to have something for every type of reading appetite. So you can start this book as a reader uh, if you have willing parents with Good Night Moon and Where the Wild Things Are and go all the way through to uh, Simone de Beauvoir's The Coming of Age and uh, uh, C.S. Lewis' is A Grief Observed. So it's cradle to grave reading, I think you could call it. Do you want to read your passage and we'll open sure, up? Sure, I'm going to read a little, just a little bit from the introduction and then we'll open it up for some questions. All right, I'll start with a line I already used, but it leads into other things. Once people know you are writing a book called The Thousand Books to Read Before You Die, you can never enjoy a dinner party in quite the way you did before. No matter how many books you've managed to consider and no matter how many pages you've written, every conversation with a fellow reader is almost sure to provide new titles to seek out or, more worryingly, to expose an egregious omission or a gap in your knowledge, to say nothing of revealing the privileges and prejudices, however unwitting, underlying your points of reference. For years, a thousand books felt like far too many to get my head around, but now it seems too few by several multiples. So let me say what already should be obvious. This book is neither comprehensive nor authoritative, even if a good number of the titles assembled here would be on most lists of essential reading. It is meant to be an invitation to a conversation, even a merry argument, about the books and authors that are missing, as well as the books and authors included. Because the question of what to read next is the best prelude to even more important ones, like who to be and how to live. Such faith in reading's power and the learning and imagination it nourishes is something I've been lucky enough to take for granted as both fact and freedom. It's something I fear may be forgotten in the great amnesia of our in-the-moment news feeds and algorithmically defined identities which hide from our view the complexity of feelings and ideas that books demand we quietly and determinedly engage. To get lost in a story or even a study is inherently to acknowledge the voice of another, to broaden one's perspective beyond the confines of one's own understanding. A good book is the opposite of a selfie. The right book at the right time can expand our lives in the way love does, making us more thoughtful, more generous, more brave, more alert to the world's wonders, and more pained by its inequities, more wise, more kind. 